celebration of uh, this more uh, this today's uh, grasp day um, we have four uh, groups, um, individuals and groups of um, presentations, of performances today. Um, and the purpose of this uh, portion, and we have all of them coming in some way from kind of creative arts, um, are ha uh, show how graduate students in those areas um, uh, sort of display the uh, work of scholarship uh, in their creative um, uh, creative productivity. Uh, and you'll see um, how, again, research inf uh, informs their creative process in all four of the presentations that you'll see this morning. Um, the first presenter uh, is Rob Kimbrough. Uh, Ka Rob is an advanced student in the MA program in theater studies in the School of Theater and Dance here at U of H, where he is studying dramaturgy with Dr. Keith Byron Kirk and Dr. Robert Shimko. Uh, Rob Kimbrough uh, received his BA in Political Science and History uh, from Rice University. Rob's research at UH focuses on stage adaptation of literary works. In Houston, he has uh, directed plays for Stages Repertory Theater, among other places, uh, and he's also taught playwriting at the Alley Theater. Uh, he founded the Madison Young Playwrights Festival in Wisconsin as well. Uh, Rob will be assisted in his presentation today by undergraduate students from the UH School of Theater and Dance Acting Program, Connor Woods, Cameron Alexander, Scholar Sinclair, Catherine Thomas, Wesley Whitson, and Matteo Penduzzi Mott. So, Rob Shimko. There was a boy called Odd. And there was nothing strange or unusual about that, not in that time or place. Odd meant the tip of a blade, and it was a lucky name. He was Odd, though. At least the other villagers thought so. But if there was one thing that he wasn't, it was lucky. Odd's father had been killed during a sea raid two years before, when Odd was 10. That was the opening of Neil Gaiman's 2009 novel, Odd and the Frost Giants. This is the opening of my stage adaptation of Odd and the Frost Giants, first presented at Stages Repertory Theater in 2011. Once there was a boy called Odd. There was nothing strange about that in those days. In Norse, the tongue of the Viking, it meant the tip of the blade. It was a good name, a lucky name. The boy was Odd. when the snows were deep, he would sit by the fire and carve wood into faces and drinking cups and toys. Odd's mother liked to cook and sew and always no, sing. Odd's mother was from Scotland. Odd didn't understand the words his mother sang. But after she sang, she would translate them and Odd's mind would roil with fine lords. Riding out on great horses. Their noble falcons on their off to get into all manner of trouble. Fighting giants! Rescuing maidens! <laughs> Freeing the oppressed from tyranny. When Odd was ten, his father was killed on a sea raid. It was three weeks after the longship had come back without his father. The time of year when Odd's father would go to his tiny woodcutter's hut and return a week later with a cart full of logs. Certain he knew everything there was to know about the Odd took down his father's axe and hauled it out into the woods. He later admitted to his mother that possibly he should have used a smaller axe than he practiced on a smaller tree. Still, what he did was remarkable. He cut a branch to lean on, for the bones in his legs were shattered. And somehow, got himself home, hauling with him his father's heavy axe, for metal was rare in those days. Odd would wear a brace on that leg for the rest of his days. After his father died, his mother sang less and less. Two years passed and Odd's mother married Fat Eldred. Who wasn't that bad when he hadn't been drinking. So Odd spent more and more time out in the great woods. Odd loved the spring, when the waterfalls began to course through the valleys and the woodland was covered with flowers. He loved the summer, when the first berries were brightening. He 
until March, when the snows would melt, the rivers would run, and the world would wake into itself again. But not that year. In both versions, Odd goes on to meet Thor, Odin, and Loki to discover that these Viking gods have been cast out of Asgard by their enemies, the Frost Giants, which causes this eternal winter, and eventually to save the day and return spring to the world. In my research at the School of Theater and Dance, I'm interested in what happens when we take stories from one medium to another. How does adaptation change stories? So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory that frames our understanding of this adaptation process and how it plays out in this piece. According to a line of thinking that goes back to Aristotle's poetics, this is an example of the epic mode of storytelling. It's a single unitary voice narrating a story to us. This, in contrast, would be the dramatic mode of storytelling, multiple voices in dialogue enacting a story for us. More recently, a Russian literary theorist named Mikhail Bakhtin has argued that modern storytellers do something in between, something relatively new and revolutionary. He calls this the novelistic mode of storytelling. According to this theory, this, the modern novel, isn't unitary at all. It's what he calls polyphonic. It contains multiple voices, it admits multiple points of view, and it can, in theory, in a sense, argue with itself. So, what do I do with that as an adapter? Looking at this piece, one of the initial challenges is the question of what to do with the narrator voice. In the text, the narrator can be largely invisible. Unless prompted, the reader is not likely to give a lot of thought to who is stringing these words together. I don't have that option on stage. I could dispense with the narrator voice entirely, but for this piece, that seemed clearly um, a mistake not a productive path to go down. So instead, what I chose to do was to split out the narrator voice and give it to the three transformed gods. In Bakhtin's terms, what I'm doing is separating out some of those multiple voices. On stage, the text can literally argue with itself. For example, when the narrator voice is confident and optimistic about Odd and his adventures. It was a good name, a lucky name. We hear that from the thunder god Thor, called friend of man in the old Icelandic poems that Neil Gaiman's drawing from. When the narrator's more skeptical, the boy was odd, though. we get that from the sly trickster god, Loki. Things that are purely subtextual in the book become sensible on stage. We can see them and hear them. Uh, for example, uh, Elfrid's displacement of Odd and his father's memory from the family home becomes the literal taking of the family chair. A length of wooden dowel can become not only the tree that crushes Odd's leg, but also the staff of the god Odin, whose powers included the ability to dole out fate to men. The songs of Odd's mother later in the play are used to represent the magic of the goddess Freya. This sensory experience, this oral experience, makes concrete a metaphorical link in the novel between the mother's love and the spells that at the end of the story restore the gods to their natural form, bring spring back to the world, heal to some extent Odd's injuries, and let him accept and move beyond the death of his father. Storytelling is an art. It has a magic that we can't completely quantify. But this kind of academic study of the, difference, of the different modes and media of storytelling let us pop the hood, as it were, and tinker with the mechanics of the story. The more that we understand about how storytelling works, the better able we as theater practitioners are to take a story that we love on the page and bring it to life for a live audience here on the stage. Thank you.